Chapter twenty two of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter twenty two. On landing from the Venezuela, Bob drove out to Collingham Lodge. He knew that by this time the family were in the Adirondacks, and that with Gull and his wife to look after him, he should have the place to himself. Now that he was known to be married, he first thought it possible to bring Jenny there, but had decided that the big empty house might frighten her with its loneliness. Her hotel in New York was what she would probably prefer, and with all he had to do for Teddy it would doubtless be most convenient for himself. He went to his old home, therefore, only as to a base from which to make further arrangements. Having unpacked a few things and eaten a snack of lunch, he would go to see his wife at once. Though he had not expected to hear from her on landing, and still less to see her at the dock, he was faintly disappointed to receive neither of these forms of greeting. He reminded himself that not her coldness, but her inexperience, would account for this, and so made the more of his anticipations for the afternoon. She had written to him while he was away, short, non-committal letters, betraying a mind unused to correspondence, rather than a heart opposed to it. Lack of habit, he told himself, would for a long time to come make her seem unresponsive, when she would only be hesitating and observant. It was the hot season at Marillo, and those houses which were not closed were somnolent. At Collingham Lodge, Max, with his madly joyful demonstrations, was the only expression of life. Within the house the shades were down, the furniture befrocked. Nevertheless it was home, and all the more home after the alien pageantry of the tropics and the south. Having bathed and changed his clothes, he found pleasure in roaming from one dim, airless room to another, as if he had been absent for a year. It was a greater pleasure for the reason that ever since receiving his father's amazing cablegram, the vague antagonism he had felt for two or three years towards his parents had given place to affection and gratitude. They had seemingly come round, after all, to acknowledging his right to be himself. The concession gave him a sense of loving them, of loving the things that belonged to them. He strolled into their rooms, looking about on the objects they used, as though in this way he got some contact with their personalities. As yet, Jenny's family hardly entered the sphere of his conceptions. He knew she had a mother and sisters. He'd seen and spoken to Teddy at the bank. But even the knowledge that the boy was in jail for killing a man didn't bring him or them near to him as realities. While there were things he should do for the boy, they would not be done for him, but for Jenny. What concerns her naturally concerns her husband, but otherwise his father and mother came first. For this new generosity on their part, for this opening of the arms, his heart glowed toward them, making them sensibly his own. He was thinking of this as he stood in his mother's room, gazing round on the chintzy comfort he had all his life regarded with some awe. Not since he had been a little boy had he felt so warmly toward her as now. A note from her at quarantine had assured him, as she had assured him before he went to South America, that she was his mother, and that in all trials he could count on her. Counting on her, he could count on everything, for however difficult his father might prove, she could manage him in the end. It made everything easier for him and for Jenny, turning an anxious outlook on life into a splendid hopefulness. He was leaving the room to go and see if Mrs. Gull had cooked a chop for him, when he noticed, propped against the wall and near the door by which he had come in, what looked like a pitcher carelessly covered with a crimson cloth. His mother had long talked of having her portrait done. He wondered if it could be that. He put his hand on it and felt the frame. It was a picture, and if a picture, undoubtedly the portrait. "'Let's see what the old lady looks like,' were the words that passed through his mind. With a twitch the cloth was off, and he sprang back. The start was one of surprise. Looking for no more than the exquisite conventionality he knew so well, this vital nudity caught his breath and made his heart leap. It was as if he had actually come on some living pagan loveliness seated in one of the empty rooms. Tannhäuser, first beholding the goddess in the secret of the Venusberg, must have felt something like this amazed tumult of the senses. Turning from the great bay window in which he had hastily pulled up the shades, his excitement had consciously in it 
a presentiment of evil. She was so alive, and so much there on purpose. Then a horror stole over him, like a chill that struck his bones. He crept forward with a stricken, fascinated stare. It couldn't be, he was saying to himself, and yet, and yet, it was. The bearings of this conviction didn't come to him all at once. The fact was as much as he could deal with. She had sat and been painted like this. His impressions were as poignant and confused as if he had seen her struck dead. He couldn't account for it. He couldn't explain the presence of the thing here in his mother's room. On the lower bar of the frame he saw an inscription plate, getting down on all fours to read it. Life and Death by Hubert Ray. So Hubert had done it. Hubert had seen her in this flinging off of mystery. Of course. His thought flashed back to the day when he first made her acquaintance. Leaning a little forward, she was sitting in this very Byzantine chair, on this very dais, wearing a flowered dress, a flower-wreathed leghorn hat in her lap. Ray, in a painting smock, was standing with the palette and brushes in his hand, making a sketch of her, more or less on the lines of a Reynolds or a Gainsborough. He had dropped him a line, telling him he had taken a studio, and inviting him to look him up. He hadn't looked him up till a week or two had gone by, but having once seen this girl, he did so soon again. Of him she had taken little or no notice. When, later, he forced himself on her attention, she made his approaches difficult. When he asked her to marry him, she had at first laughed him off, and then refused him in so many words. But as she generally based her refusal, unconsciously perhaps, on the social differences between them, he wouldn't take her no for an answer. If he could ignore the social differences, it seemed to him that she could, while the advantages to her in marrying her Collingham were evident. And all the while this is what the trouble was. What he meant by this was more than the picture Life and Death, though how much more he made no attempt to measure. The truth that now emerged for him out of his memory of the winter months was that Ray loved Jenny, that Jenny loved Ray, and that he had been a blind fool never to have seen it. He threw himself on his mother's couch, burying his face in the cushions. As much as from anything else he suffered from the breakdown of his convictions. He had been so glib on the subject of his instinct. Love could make no mistakes, he had said to Edith, but instinct couldn't. He had been the other half of Jenny. Jenny had been the other half of him. She couldn't be unfaithful to him, because he knew she couldn't. His love was protecting her like a magic cloak, while she was— The awful shame of a man whose foolish stammerings of passion are held up to public ridicule seemed to kill the heart in his body. And yet, when he staggered to his feet and strode toward the obsessing thing to pull the cloth of it again, he started back once more. The woman with the scarlet had changed. She was a coarse creature now, common and sensual. Amazement pinned him to the spot, his hands raised as if at sight of an apparition. Then, slowly, insensibly, weirdly, Jenny came back again, though not quite the Jenny he had seen at first. This Jenny retained the traits of the second woman, a Jenny coarsened, common and sensual, in spite of being exquisite too. He walked in and out of the other rooms on the floor, so as to clear his mind of the suggestion. When he came back, he saw the second woman, and the second woman only. But having moved into a new light, he found Jenny there as before. It was like sorcery. Whether the thing had a baleful life, or whether his perceptions were growing crazed, he couldn't tell. Neither could he tell what he was to do with regards to the plan he had been making. A hotel in New York now! But the immediate duties were evident. Nominally, he had come back to befriend the boy, and the boy must be befriended. To do that, he must have a knowledge of the facts. Farther than this, he had been unable to progress, even by the hour, in the early afternoon, when he was limping along Indiana Avenue. He had telephoned his coming, and Jenny had answered in a dead voice which could hardly be interpreted as a welcome. It was like a guilty voice, he said to himself, though he corrected the thought instantly to argue in favour of emotion. He had spent the intervening two or three hours arguing. Jenny was a model, 
and he must not be surprised if a model's work, however startling to one who was not a model, should seem a matter of course to her. All professions had peculiarities strange to those who didn't belong to them, and the models perhaps most of all. He couldn't judge, he couldn't condemn, he must try to understand her from her own point of view. Probably her posing in this way seemed the most natural thing in the world to her, and if so, he must make it seem the same to himself. He couldn't expect her to have the hesitations and circumspections of a girl from Marillo Park. If she was true to her own standards, it was all he had a right to look for. And yet, there was Ray. He had long seen in Hubert a fellow whom no girl could love and get away with it. These were the words he had used of his friend, and he had considered the detail none of his business. Most men were that way, more or less, and if he himself wasn't, it was not a moral excellence, but a trick of temperament. But that Jenny was in danger from Ray was a thought that never occurred to him. Her innocence and defencelessness, combined with what he had taken to be a kind of studio code of honour, would have been enough to protect her, even had his suspicions been roused, which they never were. He tried to smother those suspicions even now, saying to himself that he had nothing against her except that she had been a model, in all for which a model was ever called upon. He had that, and the timbre of her voice on the telephone. There was dismay in that voice, and terror, if it wasn't a guilty voice. But a matter of fact, it was a guilty voice. In an overwhelming consciousness of guilt, Jenny had spent the whole of the ten days since the coming of his cablegram. The man who at a distance of four or five thousand miles could know that Tommy was in jail and act so promptly for the good of all might be aware of anything. Having always seemed immense and overshadowing, he became godlike now from his sheer display of power. It was power so great that she could put forth no claim. She could only wait humbly on his will. As, hidden behind a curtain, she watched for his coming along the avenue, all her thoughts were focused into speculation as to how he would approach her. Would he be sorry for having married her? She could only fear that he would be. She had never mistrusted his mother's reading of his character, that he made love to girls one day and forgot them the next, in addition to which she had involved him in this terrible disgrace. Whatever excuse those who loved Teddy might make for him, the fact remained that to the world he was a bank robber and a murderer. All his kin must share in the condemnation meted out to him, and Bob's first task as a married man must be that of defending her and hers against public disdain. He might be as brave as a lion in doing that, but, she reasoned, he couldn't like the necessity. He might say he did, and yet she wouldn't be able to believe him. Even if he still cared for her as he had cared when he went away, his marriage to her couldn't possibly be viewed otherwise than as a misfortune, and he might not still care for her. She saw him as he limped round the corner at the very end of the street. He wore a Panama hat and a white linen suit. Luckily, Gussie and Gladys had gone back to work, and her mother was lying down. She couldn't have borne the suspense had she not been all alone. Even Pansy's searching eyes, as she stood with her little squat legs planted wide apart, trying to understand this new element of the situation, were almost more than Jenny could endure. Bob advanced slowly, examining the numbers of the houses, many of which were lacking. Seventeen, fifteen, and thirteen were, however, over their doors, so that he was duly prepared for eleven. "'I'll know by the first look in his eyes,' she kept saying to herself, whether he's sorry he married me or not. As he passed number thirteen, she got up from the arm of the big chair on which she'd been perched, and found she could hardly stand. It was all she could do to creep into the entry and open the front door. When he turned into the little cement strip leading up to it, she shrank back into the shadow. He was abreast of the two hydrangea trees before he saw her. When he did so, he stood still. It seemed to her that an unreckonable time went by before a smile stole to his lips, and when it did it was wavering, flickering, more poignant than no smile at all. Her inner comment was, Yes, he's sorry. Now I know. 
pride, another new force in her character, made of her a woman with a will, as she added, I must help him to get out of it, somehow. But Pansy, sensing a nimbus of good will as imperceptible to Jenny as the pervasive scent of the summer, lilted down the steps, raised her forepaws against his shin, and gazed up into his face adoringly. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty Three. It was a help to Bob Collingham that his first glance at Jenny decided his attitude for the near future. Whatever his doubts and questionings, he could add nothing to the trials she had to face. Whatever she had done, whatever the net of circumstances in which she had been caught, he must act as if as far as he himself was concerned, he was satisfied. Whether she loved him, or whether she didn't, or whether her duties as a model had, or had not, made her indifferent to considerations to which most people were sensitive, were questions that must be postponed. This conviction which flashed on him as he saw her shrinking in the entry was confirmed when he felt her crumpled in his arms, relieved by his presence, and yet frightened by the new conditions which it wrought. It was the same dependent but rebellious little Jenny, clinging to him, and yet trying to slip away from him. It was as if she were begging for a love which the perversity of her tortured little heart wouldn't allow her to accept. Very well, then. He must measure it out to her a little at a time, as you fed a sick person or a starving man, till she got used to it. When she was stronger, and he more at peace with himself, they could tackle the personal problems between them. So... When she struggled from his arms, he let her go, following her into the living-room. "'Gussie and Gladys are back at work,' she said at once, to explain the fact that none of his new connections were there to greet him. "'And Mamma's lying down. She always lies down at this time of day, ever since Daddy died.' She dropped into one big, shabby armchair, motioning him to another. "'And there's something else I must tell you. Ever since this thing happened to Teddy, she hasn't been, well—' not right in her mind. The stand he had taken became more imperative. A father's death, a mother's collapse, a brother's crime, had put her at the head of her little troop of three, to bear everything alone. He had left behind him an inexperienced girl. He had come back to find a woman already accustomed to rising to emergencies. The change was perceptible in the clearer, slightly older cutting of her features, as well as in the greater authority with which she spoke. Where the contours of her profile had been soft and vague, there was now a delicate chiselling. Where there had been hesitation in words, there was now the firmness of one obliged to know her mind. As she sketched her mother's mental state, he sat on the extreme edge of his big chair, straining forward so as to be near her without touching her, his fingers clasped between his knees. She continued to speak nervously, with agitation, and yet lucidly. She isn't very bad. She's only what you'd call unsettled. It's not that she does anything, but rather that, after all the years when she's worked so hard, she just sits and does nothing. It's as if she was lost in thinking. And when she comes back, she says such terribly strange things. What sort of things? For one, that it's no use living any longer, that the world's so bad that the best thing left is to get out of it. She says you can't help the world, or hope to see it improve, because human beings will always reject the principles that would make it any better. He smiled gently. I've heard people talk like that who weren't considered and unsettled in their minds. Oh, but she doesn't stop there. She tells Teddy he was quite within his rights in taking money from the bank, and when she goes to see him she begs him to be brave and not to be sorry for anything he's done. And is he sorry? "'I don't know that you could call it sorry. "'He's dazed and bewildered. "'He knows he took the money, and that he killed a man. "'But he thinks he was placed in a position where he couldn't help it.' "'And does he say who could have helped it?' "'As she looked down to that twisting and untwisting of her fingers, "'which was the chief sign of her effort at self-control, her colour rose. "'He says your father could have helped it, but I don't believe he's right.' "'No, he isn't right. Not as Dad himself sees it. 
I know he's been worried ever since your father left the bank, but he thinks he couldn't help dismissing him. Life isn't very simple for anyone, not for my dad any more than it was for yours. If I could see Teddy, would you go to see him? Go to see him? Why, that's what I came back for. I'd like to do it this very afternoon, if you'd tell me first how it all came about. You see, I don't know anything except the two or three bald facts Dad mentioned in his cablegram. It was not easy to tell this story, even to a man whom she knew to be so kind. The fact that he was her husband didn't help her, for the reason that it was because he was her husband that her pride was in revolt. Had he not been her husband, he would have been free to withdraw from this series of catastrophes. Now he could not withdraw. He was tied. Moreover, the sordid tale of domestic want became the more sordid when given fact by fact. It was the intimate story of her life, in contrast to the intimate story of his. The homely family dodges for making both ends meet, which had been the mere jest of penury between Gussie, Gladys, and herself, became ghastly when exposed to a man who had never known the lack of service and luxury, to say nothing of food and drink, since the minute he was born. She felt as if it emptied her of any little dignity she had ever possessed, as if it denuded her of self-respect. She could more easily have confessed sins to him than the shifts to which they had been put to live. Nevertheless, she went through with it, brokenly, with great effort, and yet with a kind of dogged will to drain all the dregs of the cup. "'He'll see me as I am,' was part of her underlying thought. "'He'll know then that I can't go on with this comedy of having married him. "'Even if I have, we've got to end it somehow.' "'But on his side, the reaction was different. "'He had never heard this sort of tale before. "'He had never before been in contact with this phase of poverty. "'He had known poor men in college, "'and plenty of chaps who were down on their luck. "'But the daily pinching and pairing of whole families "'just to have enough to eat and to wear "'was so new as to astonish him. For the minute it made Jenny less an individual than a type. "'My God,' he was saying inwardly, "'do human beings have to live so close to the edge as all that?' When she had told him of the incident of the cutting off the gas because they couldn't pay fifteen dollars on account, the turning point of Teddy's tragedy, his exclamation was embarrassing to them both. "'Why, I paid that for a pair of shoes!' Though she knew he meant it as a protest against the straits to which they had been put, it seemed both to him and to her to make the gulf between them wider. "'And you were going through all that,' he said, when she had finished her recital, "'during the months when I was seeing you two and three times a week at the studio. My God! I wish you could have told me!' It was the first time that a little smile came quivering to her lips. "'You don't tell things like that, not to anyone outside your family. Besides, it isn't worth while. You, you get used to them. You weren't used to it, when your mother cried and Teddy forked out the money. Not to that very thing, but to things like it. If Teddy hadn't forked out the money, we should have worried through somehow. That's the awful thing about it, that if he hadn't done it, we shouldn't have been much worse off than we'd been at other times. A little worse, yes, even a good deal, perhaps. And yet we could have lived through it. I couldn't have told you, because people of our kind don't talk about such things, not even with their neighbours. We just take them for granted. It was this taking it for granted that impressed him with such a sense of the terrible. It left so little room for living, so limited a swing to do anything but scrape. Scraping was the whole of Jenny's history. He could see it as she talked. She had never in her life had fifty dollars to do with as she chose. Perhaps she had never had five. It was not the lack of the money that overwhelmed him, but of any freedom to move, of any scope in which to grow. Forgetting his reserves of the morning, he caught her by both hands, holding them imprisoned in her lap. "'But that's all over now, Jenny. You're my wife. You're coming to me, right off, today, this very afternoon.' "'Oh, Bob, I couldn't!' If he was to be got out of it, she felt it essential to gain time. "'I couldn't leave them. Don't you see?' There's no one but me to keep house or, or to decide anything. Mamma's given up entirely, and Gussie and Gladys are both so young that I couldn't possibly leave them alone. Then we'll have to manage it some other way. 
No, not yet. Let's wait. Let's see. Waiting and seeing won't change the fact that we're man and wife, and that everyone knows it. It's been in the papers. Yes, but why did you put it in? It was her turn to seek information. To me, it was like a thunderbolt. He gave her the contents of his father's cablegram. I took it for granted that you must have told him. I shouldn't have done that. I did. I, I did tell your mother, Bob, but then I couldn't help it. He started back, releasing her hands, which she had continued holding. What? You've seen the old lady? She nodded. Yes. She sent for me to go out to Murillo Park. For heaven's sake, what made her do that? She was aware of her opportunity. If she wanted to get him out of it, now was her chance. She could tell him part of the truth and keep him dangling, or the whole of it, and let him go. Fairer to him and easier for me, was the thought on which she based her decision. She she wanted to thank me for, for not having taken you up at your word and married you. Oh, so you had to tell her that you had. And what did she say to that? She was lovely. He beamed with pleasure. She can be when she takes the notion, just as she can be the other way. She must have liked you. I I think she did. You bet she did. She'd let you see it if she didn't. So that's what smoothed the way for us. I couldn't make it out. You certainly are a little witch, Jenny. It isn't as smooth as all that. Springing to her feet, she turned her back on him, moving away toward the window. Oh, Bob, I wish I didn't have to tell you. You're so good and kind, and I've been so— It came out with a burst of confession, her arms outstretched, her hands spread palms upwards. I've been so awful. When you know— Wait. He seized her by the shoulders with a force which calms emotion from sheer fright. Wait, Jenny. I know what you're going to tell me. Oh, but you can't. It's, it's something about Ray, isn't it? She nodded dumbly. Then we'll put it off. Do you see? That isn't what I came back for. I came back about Teddy, and we must see that through before we think of ourselves. All that'll keep. It won't keep if we go and live together. Then we won't go and live together. Not till we see how it's to be done. That's just a detail. In comparison with Teddy, it doesn't matter one way or another. We'll come to it by and by. All we've got to think of now is that there's a boy whose life is hanging by a thread. Yes, but... I don't want you to be mixed up in it. I want to, to save you from, from the sacrifice and, and the disgrace. He stood back from her with a hard little laugh. Good God, Jenny, I wonder if you have the faintest idea of what love is. You can't have. Do you suppose it matters to me what I'm mixed up in, so long as it's something that touches you? Listen, let me explain to you what love is like when it's the kind I feel for you. I... He braced himself in order to bring out the words forcibly. "'I don't care what Ray is to you, or what you are to Ray. Not yet. I put that away from me, till I've gone with you through the things you've got to meet. They'll not be easy for you, but I want to make them as easy as I can. No one can do it but me, because no one cares for you as I do.' "'Oh, I know that.' "'Then if you know it, Jenny, don't force anything else on me when I'm doing my best not to think of it.' Let me just love you as well as I know how, till we do the things that are right in front of us. After that, if there's a reason why I should hand you over to Ray or to anybody else, you can tell me and I'll— Pansy's scrambling to attention, and a sound on the stairs arrested his words as well as Jenny's rising tears. Mamma's coming down, the girl whispered hurriedly. She wants to see you. Don't forget that you're not to mind anything she says. To Bob, the moment was one of awed surprise for the commanding, black-robed figure differed from all his preconceptions, as far as he had any, of Jenny's mother. Advancing rapidly into the room, she took his right hand in hers, laying her left on his head, as if in benediction. "'So you're my Jenny's husband. I hope you're a good man, for you found a good woman. Be loving to each other. The time is coming when love is all that will survive. Let me look at you.' He stood off, smiling, while she made her inspection. "'Love is all there is, anyhow, don't you think, Mrs. Follett? "'Yes, but it gets no chance in this world. "'Or is it the only thing that does get a chance?' 
It may be the only thing that does get a chance, but that chance is small. There's no hope for the world. Don't think there is, because you'll be disappointed. Each time your disappointment is worse than the last, till you end in despair. It was the strange Jenny felt obliged to interrupt. Mama, Mr. Conningham is going to see Teddy. Don't you want him to take a message? Only the message I've given him myself. That is only a little way over, and that one of two things must happen then. It would either be sleep, in which nothing will matter, or it will be life in which you'll be free, understood, supported, instead of being beaten and crushed and mangled as everyone is here. Tell him that. He felt it his duty to be cheerier. On the other hand, we may get him off, or if we can't get him off altogether. What good would that do, your getting him off? You'd be throwing him back again on a world that doesn't want him. Oh, but surely the world does. Yes, the world does. I'm wrong. It does to the same extent that it wanted his father, to give it every ounce of his strength with a pittance for his pay, to spend and be spent till he's good for nothing more, and then to be thrown aside to starve. It's possible that even now Teddy would be willing to do this if they'd only let him live. But tell him it's not good enough. I've told him, and I don't think he believes me. But you're a man, and perhaps you can make him see it. Yes, Mama dear, he'll do the best he can. It won't be the best he can if he tries to keep him here. We've passed on, my boy and I. Only our bodies are still on the earth, and that for just a little while. A year from now, and we'll both be safe. So safe. And yet you try to keep us in a world where men make a curse of everything. But Teddy himself was less reconciled than his mother to bidding the world good-bye. In proportion as his physical strength returned, the fate that had overtaken him became more and more preposterous. To suppose that he had of his own criminal intention stolen money and killed a man was little short of insane. A man had been killed by a pistol he held in his hand. He had taken money because the need was such that he couldn't help himself. But he, Teddy Follett, was neither a thief nor a murderer in any sense involving the exercise of will. He was sure of that. He declared it to himself again and again and again. It was all that gave him fighting force, compelling him to insist, to assert himself, and to protest in season and out of season against being shut up in a cell. The cell was seven feet long and four feet wide. Round the foot of the bunk and along the side there was a space of some twelve inches. At the foot there was the iron-ribbed door with a grating, and along the sides a slimy and viscous stone wall. Besides the bunk, a bucket, and a shelf, there was nothing whatever in the way of furnishings. Under the bed he was privileged to keep the suitcase with his wardrobe, and on the shelf whatever his mother and sisters brought him in the way of food. By day the only light was through the grate into the corridor. By night a feeble electric barb was extinguished at half-past nine. The brig, being an ancient prison, and Teddy but one of a long, long line of murderers who had lain on this hard bed, vermin infested everything. While Bob Collingham was on his way to him, Teddy was in conversation with the chaplain. For this purpose, the door had been unlocked. The visitor leaned against the doorpost, while the prisoner stood in the narrow space between his bunk and the wall. It was the Protestant chaplain, a tall, spare, sandy-haired man of some fifty-odd, whose yearning spiritual face had, through long association with his flock, grown tired and disillusioned. Having sought this post from a genuine sympathy with outcast men, he suffered from their rejection. He was so sure of what would help them, and only one in a hundred ever wanted it. Even that one generally laughed at it when he got out of jail. After eighteen years of self-denying work, the worthy man was sadly pessimistic now as to prospects of reform. For the minute, he was trying to convince Teddy of the righteousness of punishment. He had been drawn to the boy partly because of his youth and good looks, but mainly on account of his callousness to his crime. He seemed to have no conscience, no notion of the difference between right and wrong. A moral moron was what he labelled him. The lack of ethical consciousness was the more astonishing because his antecedents had apparently been good. 
"'You see,' he was pointing out, "'you can't break the law by which society protects itself "'and yet escape the moral and physical results.' "'But in his long, solitary hours Teddy had been thinking this out. "'Doesn't that depend upon the laws? "'If the law's wrong, but who is to judge of that? "'Isn't the citizen to judge of that?' "'The parson smiled, his weary, spiritual smile. "'If the citizen was allowed to judge of that, "'if he wasn't,' Teddy broke in, with the impetuosity born of his beginning to think for himself. If he wasn't, there'd be no such country as the United States. Most of the fireworks in American history are over the fine thing it is to beat the law to it when the law isn't just. Ah, but there's a distinction between individual action and great popular movements. Great popular movements must be made up of individual actions, mustn't they? If individuals didn't break the laws, each guy on his own account, "'You wouldn't get any popular movements at all.' "'The chaplain shifted his ground. "'All the same, there are certain laws that among all peoples and at all times have been considered fundamental. "'Human society can't permit a man to steal. "'Then human society shouldn't put a man in a position where he either has to steal or starve to death.' "'There was a repetition of the thin, ghostly smile.' "'Oh, well, no one who's ordinarily honest and industrious ever, ever starves to death. That's a lie. Excuse me,' he added apologetically, "'but that kind of talk just gets my goat. My father practically starved to death. He died from lack of proper nourishment, the doctor said. And there never was a more industrious or an honester man born. He gave everything he had to human society, and when he had no more to give, human society kicked him out.' "'It has the law on his side, too, and because,' he gulped, "'I came to his help in the only way I knew how. "'They've chucked me into this black hole.' "'The chaplain found another kind of opening. "'So you see, my boy, there's that. "'If you don't keep the law, they can make you suffer for it,' "'Teddy declared excitedly. "'Of course they can. They've made me suffer. "'God, how they've made me suffer. "'More, I believe, than anyone since Jesus Christ. "'But that's not what we were talking about.' You started in to tell me that it's right for me to suffer all the way they're making me. That's what I kick against, and I'll keep on kicking till they send me to the chair. If you could do yourself any good by that. But just here the dialogue was interrupted by the appearance of Bull, the dapper, debonair young guard who generally announced Teddy's afternoon visitors. Hello, old cuss. Gent to see ya. The chaplain prepared to move on to the neighbouring cell. His leave-taking was kindly and with a great pity in it. "'We'll go on with this talk again, my boy. When you're able to get the right point of view—' What would happen then was drowned in the clanging of the door behind him as Teddy stepped out into the corridor. "'Who is it? Stenhouse?' he asked as he walked along with the guard. He had already dropped into the prisoner's habitual tone of hostile friendliness towards the officials with whom he came most in contact, recognising the fact that had he met any of these men on the outside, they would have hobnobbed together with the freemasonry of American young men everywhere. On their sides, the keepers, apart from the fact that they considered Teddy a tough lot, had ceased to show him animosity. "'Now, it's not the lawyer,' Poole answered him now. "'It's a swell guy with a limp. Looks to me if he might be the gay young banker sport that the paper says he's married to your sister.' Teddy felt his heart contracting in a spasm of dread. The one fact he knew of his brother-in-law was that he had sent him Stenhouse, one of the three or four lawyers most famous at the New Jersey bar for saving lives. This detail, too, the boy had learned from Bull. you are not get the current with him to defend you, believe me. Some bird. If he can't prove you're innocent, you'll find a flaw in the law or the indictment or something. Why, they say he once got a guy off, a pole the fellow was, just on the spelling of his name. Having been warned by Senhouse not to discuss his case with anyone, Teddy was discreetly silent. As a matter of fact, he had too much to think of to be inclined to talk. The circumstance that young Cole had become a relative was one of which he was just beginning to seize the importance. His bruised mind had been unable to first to apprehend it. Slowly he was coming to the realised knowledge that he was allied to that Olympian race which the Colliams represented to the Follets, and that at least some of their power was engaged on his behalf. It was confusing. 
Since the might that had struck him down was also coming to his aid, the issue was no longer clear-cut. To have all the right on one side, and all the wrong on the other, had simplified life. Now, a right that was partly wrong, and a wrong that was partly right, had been personified, as it were, in this union through which a collingham had become a follet, and a follet a collingham. Young Coll was standing where Jenny had stood on the first occasion of Teddy's coming to the visitor's room. He, too, waited with a smile. The minute he saw the lad appear timidly on the threshold, he limped forward with outstretched hand. "'Hello, Teddy!' His embarrassment, being a kindly embarrassment, was without awkwardness. "'You didn't know I was going to be your brother the last time you saw me, did you?' Teddy said nothing. He was not sullen, but neither was he friendly. A Collingham, even though married to his sister, was probably a person to be feared. Teddy's counsel to himself was to be on his guard against the nigger in the woodpile. "'Perhaps it was my fault that you didn't,' Bob went on, with some constraint. "'That's the reason why I'm here. I dare say there isn't much I can do for your old boy, but what little there is, I want to do.' Teddy eyed him steadily, still without making a reply. Somehow they found chairs. Bull, having once more summed up the visitor, had retreated towards the guard, who sat officially at the far end of the room. "'Looks like a good cuss,' was Bull's whisper of confidence. "'Kind of soft, like most of them swell sports at Mary's working goils.' Bob was finding himself less and less at his ease. The boy not only came none of the way to meet him, but seemed to hold him as an enemy. By his silence, and by the severity of his regard, he conveyed the impression that young Coll, and not himself, had done the wrong. It was an attitude for which Bob was not prepared. Neither was he prepared for the defacement of all that had been glowing in the lad's countenance. Jenny had warned him against expecting the ruddy, bright-eyed Teddy of the bank, but he hadn't looked for this air of youth blasted out of youthfulness. It was still youth, but youth marred, terrified, haunted, with a fear beyond that of gibbering old age. With his lovingness and quickness of pity, Bob sought for a lion by which he could catch on to the lad's interest. "'I asked my father to send you the best counsel in New Jersey, and I believed he picked out Stenhouse.' Tenney regarded him grimly. "'Yes, he did.' It seemed as if he meant to say no more, when, with a sardonic grunt, he went on, something like a guy who smashes a machine and then gets the best mechanician in the world to come and patch it up. Yes, possibly, it may be, only there's this to consider, that no one smashes a machine on purpose. No, I don't suppose he does, and it's all the same to the machine, whether it's been smashed on purpose or by accident, so long as it'll never run again. Bob considered this. You might say that of a machine, a dead thing from the start. You can't say it of a human being who's alive from the beginning. See? No, I don't see. And I don't know that I can explain. I'm only sure that a machine can be done for, that a human being can't be. You can come to a time when it's no use doing anything more for the one, but you can never reach such a time with the other. With him, you may make mistakes, or you may do him a great wrong, but you can't stop trying to put things right again. "'And you think you can put things right again for me?' "'I don't know what I can do. I haven't an idea. "'Very likely I can't do anything at all. "'I merely came back from South America to do what I could.' "'Did you feel that you had to, because you'd married Jenny?' "'That was a reason. It wasn't the only one. "'What else was there?' "'I'm not sure I can tell you. "'A lot of the things we do we do not from reason, but from instinct.' "'But if you don't want me to try to take a hand—' "'Under the dark streaks that blotted out what had once been Teddy's healthy colouring, "'a slow flush began to mantle. "'I don't want to be—to be bamboozled.' "'Of course you don't. But how could I bamboozle you?' "'There was no explanation. "'Unable to base his distrust on any other ground than that Bob was the son of the man "'who dismissed Josiah Follett from the bank—' Teddy fell silent again. He could not afford to reject the least good will that came his way, and yet his spirit was too sore to accept it graciously. 
Some of this young Collingham divined. He began to see that as the boy was suffering, and he wasn't, it was not for him to take offence. On the contrary, he misused all his ingenuity to find the way to make his appeal effectively. "'All I could do from down there,' he said, when Teddy seemed indisposed to speak again, "'was to get Stenhouse, or someone, to take up your case. "'I mean to see him in the morning, and find out how far he's got along with it. "'But now that I'm here, can't you think of something of your own that you'd like me to do?' "'Teddy raised his eyes quickly. "'His look was the dull look of anguish, and yet with sharpness in the glance. "'What kind of thing?' "'Any kind.' Think of the thing that's most on your mind, the thing that worries you more than anything else, and, and, and put it up to me. The sombreness deepened in the lad's face, not from resentment, but from heaviness of thought. Go ahead, Bob urged. Cough it up. If it's something I can't tackle, I'll tell you so. What's most on my mind, Teddy began slowly, gritting his teeth at the effort to get the words out, what worries me like hell is Ma. "'And the girls, they must be lonesome, something fierce, without me.' "'In his agony of controlling himself, he was rubbing his palms between his knees. "'But Bob put out his great hand and seized him by the wrist. "'Look here, old chap, I can't comfort them for your not being there. "'You know that, of course. "'But it always helps women to have a man coming and going in the house, "'to take a lot of things off their hands and keep them company.' "'and I'll do that. "'If I can't be everything that you'd be, "'you can be more than I could ever be. "'Yes, from the point of view of having a little more money "'and freedom and a car to take them out in and all that. "'But do you think I could ever make up for them, for you, old sport? "'But that isn't what you want me to do, is it? "'You don't want me to be you, but to be something different, "'only something that'll make your mother and Jenny and your little sisters buck up again.' Stumbling to his feet, Teddy drew the back of his hand across his eyes. "'I, I guess I'd better beat it,' he muttered unsteadily. They, "'They don't like you to stay out too long.' But Bob forced him gently back into his chair again. "'Oh, cheese that, Teddy. Sit down and let's get better acquainted. I want to tell you how Jenny and I made up our minds to get married.' End of chapter 23《ハッピーバースデーサクバズルキング》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 24 And yet it's one of the commonest types of the criminal mind, Stenhouse was explaining to Bob during the following forenoon. Fellows perfectly normal in every respect but that of their own special brand of crime. See no harm in that, whatever. Won't have a cigar. Having declined the cigar for the third time, Bob found a subconscious fascination in watching the lawyer's Havana travel from one corner to the other of his long, mobile, thin-lipped mouth. It was interesting, too, to get a view of Teddy's case different from Jenny's. There was nothing about Stenhouse, unless it was his repressed histrionic intensity, to suggest the savour of lives. Outwardly, he was a lank, clean-shaven Yankee of ill-assorted features and piercing, gimlet eyes. But something about him suggested power and an immense persuasiveness. He had only to wake from the quiescent mood in which he was talking to Bob to become an actor or a demagogue. With laughter, tears, pathos, vituperation, satire, and repartee all at his command, together with an amazing knowledge of criminal law, he was born to commend himself to the average juryman. Little of this was apparent, however, except when he was in action. Just now, as he lounged in his revolving chair, his limber legs crossed, his thumbs in the armholes of his waistcoat, and his perfecto moving as if by its own volition along the elastic lines of his mouth, he was detached, impartial, judicial, with that manner of speaking which the French describe as from high to low, de haut en bas, the good mixer with a sense of his own superiority. The lack of the human element was to Bob the most disconcerting trait in the lawyer's frame of mind. To him the case was a case and neither more nor less. The boy's life, so precious to himself, was of no more account to Stenhouse than that of a private soldier to his commanding officer 
on the day when a position must be rushed. Stenhouse was interested in the professional advantage he himself might gain from the outcome of the trial. In a less degree, he was interested in Teddy's psychology as a new slant on criminal mentality in general. But the results, as they affected his client's fate, concerned him not at all. "'I'm talking to you frankly,' he went on, "'because it's the only way we can handle the business. "'You're making yourself responsible in the case, "'and so I must tell you what I think.' "'Oh, of course. "'I quite understand your connection with this young fellow "'and why I'm taking the matter up, "'but I must treat you as if you were aloof from it in sentiment, "'as I am myself.' "'That's exactly what I want.' "'Well, then, the boy's in a bad fix. "'It's a worse fix because he belongs to the dangerous criminal type "'for whom you can never get a jury's sympathy.' Roughly speaking, there are two classes of criminals, the criminals by accident and the criminals born. This boy is a criminal born. Oh, did you think so? I know so. Yes, sir, you can't have as much to do with both lots as I've had without learning to read them at sight. And when it comes to drawing them out, why, he hasn't told me a half of his story before I could see he'd had murder on the brain for the best part of his life. I shouldn't have thought that. No, you wouldn't. Not of it subconscious suppressed desire, Freud, and all that. But start him talking, and it's, God, I'd have shot that fellow if I'd had a gun. Or it's, if I'd had a dose of poison, they'd never have got me alive. Mine ran on it. Yes, sir, always thinking of doing somebody in, if not another fellow, then himself. I don't think he knew it. Of course he didn't know it. it. Seemed natural to him. Our own vices always do seem natural to us. If you put it up to him now, he'd say he'd never had a thought of shooting up anyone. "'and he wouldn't be lying out of it either. "'Way it seems to him. "'Way it seems to every criminal of the class. "'But to judges and juries is just so much bull, "'and tells against the accused in the end. "'Sure you won't have a cigar?' "'Having again declined the cigar, "'Bob argued in favour of Teddy, "'but Stenhouse was fixed in his convictions. "'I'll do what I can for him, of course, "'only I'm blocked by his refusal to plead guilty. "'Pleading guilty might... I don't say it would, but it might incline the judge to mercy. It would get him off, too, with the second degree, only that when his own story shows him as guilty as hell, he keeps pulling the innocent stuff to beat a jazz band. The rascal who plumps with his confession will always get the clemency, while the fellow with a mouthful of innocence will be sent to the chair. But if he does feel that he's innocent— Ah, sure he feels that he's innocent. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. "'the ingrained criminal's lack of consciousness "'that his kind of crime is crime. "'The other fellows, yes, but his. "'Why, the law is a fool to be made that way "'and trip a good fellow up. "'To hear this young shaver talk, "'you'd think the court should be manned by pickpockets.' "'All the same, he was in a tight place. "'What's that got to do with it? "'If we didn't get into tight places, "'there'd be no need for laws of any kind. "'I was only thinking of his motive. "'Oh, his motive may have been all right.' I'll not dispute you there, because you'll find that legally there's a difference between motive and intent. His motive may be to provide for his mother, just as he says. Good, no harm in that, whatever. But his intent was to rob a bank and shoot the guy that came out after him. The court won't go into his motives. It'll deal only with his intent and with what came of it. There was more along these lines, which sent Bob away with some questioning as to himself. Being of a law-respecting nature, he was anxious not to uphold the transgressor to anything like a danger-point, and he ran that risk. Having undertaken to help Teddy on Jenny's account, his heart had gone out beyond what he expected to the boy himself. It was the first time he had ever been in contact with a prisoner, the first time he had ever come face to face with a lone individual against whom all the organised forces of the world were focused in condemnation. His impulse being to range himself on the weaker side, he had, in a measure, so ranged himself. He had told Teddy that he stood by him, and would continue to stand by him through thick and thin. But was he right? Had he shown the proper severity? Hadn't he been sloppy and sentimental, without sufficiently remembering that a man who has killed another man was not to be handled as a pet? It was not common sense to treat the breaker of laws as if he hadn't broken them, or as if his punishment had made him a sympathetic figure and, by putting himself on the weaker side, a man might find himself on the worse one. Even the fact that the wrongdoer was a relative ought not to blind the eyes to his being a wrongdoer. 
It was his duty as a citizen, Bob argued, to support the charter of the rights of man as set forth in the Old Testament. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. The ideal of the Old Testament. Neither was there among them any that lacked, for they had all things common, never having been called to his attention. As to Teddy's being a criminal born, he was not sure. Perhaps he was. Such sports appeared even from the most respectable stock. There was a dark tradition, never mentioned now except between Edith and himself, of a Collingham, they were not sure of the relationship, who had died in jail somewhere in the West. Of the Follett stock, Bob knew nothing. Jenny was the other half of himself. But such affinities, he was sheepishly inclined to feel, dated from other worlds and other planes of existence, though finding a manifestation in this one. But it was Jenny who gave him the lead he was in search of. "'I should think there were plenty of them to attend to that,' she said, when he had expressed as delicately as he could his misgivings as to his own lack of rigour. "'Whatever he did, and however bad it was, they've got all the power in the world to punish him, and they're going to do it. When there's just one person on earth to show him a little pity, I shouldn't think it could be too much.' She added, after a second or two of silence, "'He was sorry you didn't go in to see him. He missed you. I, I think he's going to cling to you just like a drowning man, you know, to a hand that's stretched out to him from a boat. Very likely he'll have to drown, but so long as the hand is there it's, it's something.' In this speech, which was long for Jenny, and betokened her growing authority, there were two or three points on which Bob pondered as he drove them homeward from the brig. Jenny sat beside him, Lizzie in the back seat. He took the longest and prettiest ways, so as to give them something like an outing. It was the afternoon of the day on which he had seen Stenhouse, and in the interval he had been thinking out a programme. Whatever the restrictions he must put upon himself with regard to the boy— his duty to protect and distract Jenny and her family was clear. Teddy had also given him to understand that, more than anything done for himself, this would contribute to his peace of mind. Done for his mother and sisters, it would be done for him, and the doer could be sure that he wasn't loosening the foundations of society. Even where there was a born criminal to be judged, and perhaps put out of the way, something was gained when the innocent could be saved to any possible degree from suffering with the guilty. In this, too, he was not without an eye to Indiana Avenue. Though he had no experience of suburban life, he was intuitive enough to feel sure that, to the neighbours, Jenny's marriage had a queer look, and the more so since she was not living with her husband, now that he was back from South America. To counteract this, he meant to show himself in the street as much as possible, parading his car before the door. There must be no cheap gossip as to Jenny based on lack of his devotion, even though all arrangements between her and himself were no more than provisional. To that point, then, his course was clear. He could not console the mother, whose reason was stricken at its base, nor the three young girls whose lives were overshadowed by tragedy. But he could divert their minds from dwelling too much on calamity, by bringing in a new interest. He could make it a big interest. He could enlarge the interest in proportion to their need. And, as Jenny spoke, it dawned on him that they themselves began to foresee that their need might be great indeed. They've got all the power in the world to punish him, and they're going to do it. He's going to cling to you like a drowning man. Very likely he'll have to drown. Jenny had had one or two interviews with Stenhouse, and perhaps had inferred from that great man's talk the difficulties of his task. But the help she gave Bob was in her response to his misgivings. "'When there's just one person on earth to show him a little pity, I shouldn't think it could be too much.' "'It couldn't be too much, not possibly. The worst enemy of mankind had a right to a, a little pity, and even Judas Iscariot had received it. If Teddy didn't get it from him, Bob, he wouldn't get it from anyone, his mother and sisters apart. All civilised men were lined up against him, and doubtless could not be lined in any other way. In that case, punishment was assured, and as Jenny said, there were plenty of people to take care of its infliction. He, Bob Collingham, 
since he stood alone, might well forget the heavy score against the boy in, in bucking him up to meet what lay ahead of him. He worked this out before driving Jenny and her mother to their door, after which he waited for Gussie and Laddies to come home from work to take them, too, for an airing. Jenny sat beside him as on the earlier drive, the two younger girls in the seat behind. To both, the expedition was as the first stage of a glorification which might carry them up to any heights. Taken in connection with what they suffered on account of Teddy, it was like drinking an unmingled draught of the very bitter and the very sweet. Hardly able to lift up their heads from shame, they nevertheless felt the distinction of going out in an expensive, high-powered car with a gentleman of wealth and position, who thus publicly proclaimed himself their relative. "'This'll settle Addie Inglis and Samuel a Weatherby,' Gladys whispered, in reference to some taunt or aspersion which Gussie understood. "'Say, Gussie, some sport, isn't he? Jen sure did cop a twenty-cylinder.' But Gussie had already turned over her new leaf. From the corner where she reclined with the grace of one accustomed from birth to this style of conveyance, she arched her lovely neck and turned her lovely head just enough to convey a hint of reprimand. Gladys, dear, Mamma wouldn't like you to use that kind of language. Remember that now we must carry out her wishes all the more because she isn't able to enforce them. Your companions may not always be hatty bellwether and sunshine bright, and so— "'Say, Gus, what struck you? Has going out in a swell rig like this gone to your head?' "'Yes, dear, perhaps it has, and if you'll take my advice, you'll let it go to yours.' The only immediate response from Gladys was a cocking of the eye and a of the tongue against the cheek, something like a Zulu vowel. But Gussie noticed that in Palisade Park, where they descended from the car to make Bob's acquaintance, Gladys reverted to the intonation and idiom in which she had first picked up her English. The jaunt tended to deepen the sensation which had been creeping over the girls within the last few days, that they were heroines of a dramatic romance. They had figured in the papers, their beauty, personalities, and histories, becoming points of vital national concern. One legend made them the scions of an ancient English family fallen on evil days, but now to be revived through alliance with the Collinghams. One another came near enough to the truth to embody the Scarborough tradition and connect them with the historic house in Cambridge. In no case was there any waste of the picturesque, the detail that Jenny had been an artist's model, and the most beautiful woman in America being especially underscored. It was only little by little that Gussie and Gladys came to a sense of this importance, thus finding themselves enabled to react to some small degree against their sense of disgrace. In the shop Gussie had heard Corinne whisper to a customer, "'That pretty girl over there is a sister of Follett, who murdered Flynn, and whose sister made that romantic marriage with the banker.' Though she glanced up from the feather she was twisting only through the tail of her eye, Gussie could reckon the excitement caused by this announcement. When it had been made a second time, and a third, as new customers came in, she saw herself an asset to the shop. Stared at, wondered at, disgusted and appraised, she began to feel as princesses and actresses when recognised in streets. Similarly, Hattie Bellwether had run to Gladys to report what Miss Flossie Grimm had said over the counter in the intervals of displaying stockings. "'See that little red-headed snub-nosed thing over there? That's the folly girl, sister to the guy that shot the detective and the girl that married the banker sport. Some hummer he must be. Jenny, the married one's name is. They say she's had an offer of a hundred plunks a week to go into Vaudeville. Fast colour? Oh, yes, we don't carry any other kind.' Thus Gladys began to find it difficult to discern between notoriety and eminence, moving among the other cash-girls as a queen incognita among ordinary mortals. Most of this publicity was over by the time Bob reached New York, though the echo still rumbled through the press. His own arrival reawakened some of it, offering opportunities that were never ignored of drawing dramatic contrasts. He was represented as having been born in the purple, and stooping to a maiden of low degree, Low degree was poetically fused with the occupation of a model. By one publication the statement was thrown in, without comment, and as it were accidentally, that the present Mrs. Robert Bradley Collingham, Jr. of Barillo Park 
have been greatly admired by appreciative connoisseurs as the figure in Hubert Ray's already famous picture, Life and Death. Hubert Ray was even credited with discovering this beauty when she was starving in the slums. Except for the detail of Ray's picture, the publicity was something of a relief to Bob, since it left him nothing to explain. The truth in these many reports being tolerably easy to disengage, his friends and acquaintances knew of his position, and in view of its circumstances they respected it. He went to the bank, he went to his club, he passed the time of day with such neighbours as remained at Murillo Park, finding it the easier to come and go because everyone knew what had happened. From almost the first day he fell into a routine. The bank, Stenhouse, Teddy, Indiana Avenue. Though he was not yet working at the bank, he felt it wise to show himself daily on the premises, in order to establish the fact that his relations with his family were unchanged. Stenhouse he didn't visit every day, but only when there were matters connected with the case to talk over. He saw Teddy as often as the brig regulations would allow, growing more and more touched by the eagerness with which the boy welcomed him. In Indiana Avenue he was assiduous. Whatever the hints flung out by Addie Inglis and Samuela Weatherby, they received contradiction, as far as that was possible, from obvious devotion. As for his personal relations with Jenny, they changed little from the modus vivendi agreed upon. That she was growing more and more grateful was evident, but gratitude wasn't what he wanted. What he wanted he himself didn't know, and in a measure he didn't care. Till she got what she wanted, he could never be solely satisfied. And if she wanted Ray... But at this point his reasoning faculties failed him. If she wanted Ray, and if Ray wanted her, there would of course be but one thing for him to do. It was that one thing itself which remained elusive or obscure, dodging, disturbing, and defying him. He could find a means to give Jenny her freedom, or he could take her by brute force, or in certain circumstances he could dismiss her as not worthy of his love. The trouble was that he couldn't see himself doing any of the three, and yet, if what seemed to be true was true, he couldn't see himself as doing the other thing. The modus vivendi, like all other arrangements of its kind, was therefore safe and convenient. It settled nothing, but it was what the term implied, a way of living. It was not an ideal way of living, or a way that shielded anyone from comment, but it was a way. As for comment, it reached Bob only indirectly, and not oftener than every now and then. Perhaps it came in as appointed a form as it ever assumed for him, in a seemingly chance remark from the chauffeur's wife, Mrs. Gull. It was not a chance remark, for the neat, pretty, thin-lipped, pinch-faced Englishwoman who had passed all her life in service didn't make ill-considered observations. "'I suppose we shall see the young lady down, sir, some day soon?' "'Yes, some day soon,' Bob replied, cautiously, getting ready in the hall to go to town. "'To remain?' It was all summed up in those three syllables. All the gossip on the Collingham estate, and all the states of Murillo, not to go farther afield. "'Not to remain just yet,' Bob answered judiciously. "'Mrs. Follett isn't well, and Mrs. Collingham has two younger sisters whom she has to take care of.' That this explanation was not adequate he knew, and yet it was an explanation. "'It certainly do seem queer,' Mrs. Gull observed to the gardener and the gardener's wife, in a company that included Gull. And Gull, who was from Somersetshire, replied, "'He most sure and certainly do.' But on the Sunday afternoon, two weeks after Bob's return, the young lady paid her visit to Collingham Lodge, accompanied by her mother and two sisters. The journey was made in what Gladys characterised as style, a style being mainly supplied by Gull in his sedate chauffeur's uniform. But the fact that he drove the car left Bob free to sit with his guests in the tonneau. He put Jenny, as hostess and mistress of the car, in the right-hand corner, Mrs. Follett in the left one, and Gussie in the middle. He and Gladys occupied the adjustable seats behind the chauffeur. At sight of the light linen rug with the Collingham initials in crimson applique, Gussie and Gladys exchanged appreciative glances, 
and they both searched the neighbouring piazzas for a glimpse of Addie Inglis or Samuela Weatherby. Acquainted now with the fact that Jenny had viewed the celestial country whither they were travelling, and with her descriptions of the wonders she had seen almost learned by rote, the girls came near to forgetting that Teddy was in a cell. But his mother didn't forget it. Silent, austere, incapable of pleasure, and waiting only the moment of the boy's release, and her own, her eyes roamed the parched September landscape, and saw none of it. She did not appear unhappy, only removed into a world of her own, a world of long, long thoughts. No one said much. There was not much to say, and a great deal to think about. Even the house, the terraces, the gardens, called forth no more than O's and R's of approval. Gladys declared that she felt herself wandering through the castle scenes in The Silver Queen, the latest screen masterpiece, but no one else dissented to such comparisons. "'It's like heaven,' Gussie murmured timidly to Bob, as they strolled between hedges of dahlias. "'Oh, no, it isn't,' he laughed. Three or four places in Marilla are much finer than this.' Subdued by sheer ecstasy, they assembled on the flagged terrace, where Mrs. Gow brought out tea. Bob was pleased at Jenny's bearing towards the chauffeur's wife, friendly, with just the right touch of dignity. "'Mr. Collingham tells me you're English. We're almost English ourselves since we were born in Canada. I've never been in England, but I should so love to go, though they say it's quite different since the war.' There was no more to it than that, but Mrs. Gull reported to her husband, "'As much a lady as any I've ever served under, and I do know a lady when I see her.' "'Miss Edith's a lady, too, but not a patch on this one. "'She may have been just as bad as they say she was, "'but you never believe it to look at her. "'And the sisters behave as pretty as pretty. "'Oh, dear, and they with a murderer for a brother. "'Do seem queer now, don't it?' "'To which Gar replied in his usual antiphon, "'He most sure and certainly do.' "'The jarring chord in this comedy came from Lizzie, while Bob was in search of Gar to bid him bring round the car. Lizzie stood looking down the two flowered terraces, where, in honour of the visitors, the fountains had been turned on. "'I understand now why they couldn't afford to pay your father his forty-five a week. It must cost a great deal of money to keep this establishment going.' "'Oh, Mamma," Gussie pleaded, "'don't begin to hang crape just when we were able to enjoy ourselves a little.' Lizzie turned on her daughter, her rare, and almost forgotten a smile. "'Very well, dear, enjoy yourself. Only a world in which enjoyment must be bought at such a price is not a fit world for human beings to live in.' Gladys crept up, snugly against her mother's shoulder. "'Yes, Mamma, darling, but you won't say that any more till we get home now, will you? It might hurt poor Bob's feelings if you did, and you can't say that he's ever done us any harm.' End of chapter 24《Twenty Five of the Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty Five. On the day after the visit to Collingham Lodge, Bob left for the camp in the Adirondacks. As yet, he had no knowledge of the family's attitude towards him more exact than he could infer. He had written to them all since his return, but their replies, even Edith's, had been non-committal. He guessed that they had decided together not to express themselves fully till they came face to face with him. Even then the approach to his own affairs was indirect. An affectionate family reunion, based seemingly on the grounds that nothing had happened when so much had, blocked the openings for bringing up the subjects he had most at heart. During the early part of that first evening at Sugar Maple Point he couldn't get anyone alone. Not till nearly bedtime did he himself offer a lead by strolling out in the moonlight in the hope that one of the three would follow him. It was full moonlight, turning Sugar Maple Lake into a sheet of silver and gold laid at the base of a velvety silhouette of mountains. The magic of stillness, the tang of the forest, the repose of the spirit from the girding and striving of the world, these lovelinesses came to Bob Collingham with a peace such as they always brought but which to-night couldn't find a resting-place. 
He couldn't find a resting place, because in this tranquil woodland, more than anywhere else, he found himself wishing that Teddy Follett wasn't in a cell. Sugar Maple Lake is small for the Adirondacks, being no more than three miles long and a mile and a half in width. All its shores are owned by rich men, mostly from New York, who can keep themselves secluded. In seclusion, they are able to combine rusticity with the amenities of life, in a wealthy, modern, American version of Marie Antoinette's humble village of Versailles. At a stranger's first glance, the camps are but lumbermen's log cabins on a larger scale. But when you come to the conveniences and luxuries of living, they differ little from Murillo Park. Reaching the thin line of maples and pines fringing the edge of the lake, Bob turned to see if he was followed. At first there was no one. The light from the windows and doors made a golden splotch on the greenish-silvery black of the sloping lawn, but no figure appeared in the glow. Coming to the conclusion that this, too, was a put-up job, he was strolling back again when his mother, cloaked against the night air, stole out and called his name softly. On reaching him she took his arm, and together they picked their way along a gravel path leading towards the point. "'I'm so glad you've come,' she said instantly. "'I've been having such a terrible time with your father. You know how he is, so stern, so relentless.' "'He's been corking to me.' "'You mean the cablegram he sent you to Rio?' "'Oh, well, I made him do that. "'It's all over now, dear, and you mustn't worry. "'But at first, that night when we heard that the Fordit boy had got into trouble, "'and I had to tell your father of your marriage, "'well, I don't want to make things out worse than they are, "'so I shan't tell you what he said. "'But I did manage him. "'I soothed him and told him how he ought to take it and what he ought to do, "'with the result that you got that message.' "'You mustn't think it was easy, dear. "'You've been a brick, old lady. "'I'm your mother, Bob. "'It's all summed up in that. "'Whatever makes for my children's happiness "'makes for mine. "'Your father is not a woman, "'and that's the difference between us. "'And now I've had all this trouble with him "'over Edith's engagement. "'But he's given in at last.' "'Bob sprang away from her. "'Edith engaged? "'Who to? "'Not to Ailing?' "'She took his arm again, "'continuing towards the point.' "'Yes, to Ernest. He was so opposed to it. "'But I've battled for my child's heart, Bob, and I've won out. "'Your father is giving her ten thousand a year. "'It isn't much, but they ought to be able to manage. "'We didn't write you partly because it was only settled last week, "'and it was easier to wait and tell you. "'But I thought you didn't like the match yourself, old girl. "'Oh, me! I have to turn myself everywhere at once. "'I've no wishes of my own. "'To reconcile my children to their father—' and their father to my children, is all I live and work for. Coming to the little rustic gazebo perched on the tip of the point, they entered and sat down. There being nothing to obtrude itself here on lake and moon and mountain, it was as if they had left human crudities behind. In the windless air, the fragrance of Bob's cigarette mingled with the aromatic pungency of millions and millions of growing things. "'There was simply nothing else to be done,' Junior resumed. "'There was Edith, eating her heart out, and stubborn as a mule, "'with the mess you've made of things, not that you could foresee, "'or know the sort of people you were getting in among. "'It was the opening he'd been looking for, "'and he knew that, whatever the outcome, he must use it. "'Exactly what do you mean by that, Mother?' "'She seemed confused. "'I don't suppose I mean anything, except what's obvious.' Not to press the point at once, he said. You saw Jenny? Yes, I sent for her. What did you think of her? Oh, what anyone would think. She's charming to look at. Only to look at? Her manner is charming, too, of course. I I don't quite know what you want me to say. How much did she tell you that afternoon? She looked at him through the moonlight. Hasn't she told you? She told me nothing, except that you were lovely. "'Then, Bob, dear, I'm afraid I can't add anything. "'You see, they were her secrets. "'Oh, then she told you secrets. "'Why, of course. What did you think? "'Any other secrets besides that she and I had been married?' "'Bob, darling, I don't think it's fair to put me on the witness stand. "'She's your wife, and because she's your wife I accept her. "'What I know is buried here,' she smote her chest. 
and if, for your sake and hers, I try to forget it, I think you might let me. For a few minutes he smoked in a silence, broken only by the maniac cry of a loon in the distance. "'Did it occur to you?' he asked at last, that she was a very simple girl who could easily become entangled in her talk when she tried to explain things to a woman of the world? No, because the things said were very simple, just statements of fact as to which there could be no misunderstanding. Had the statement of fact anything, he moistened his dry lips, anything to do with, with Hubert? Some of them, but there, she caught herself up. You're not going to make me tell you things. I'm your mother, and if I intervene at all it must be in the way of helping you to come together and not of putting you apart. She rose, drawing her cloak about her. I think I must go in, dear. I'm beginning to feel the damp. He too rose, sitting down again sideways on the rustic rail of the summer-house. Wait a minute, mother. I want to ask you something. When I was at Marilla I wandered into your room one day and saw a picture. A picture? Yes, a picture, and I... I wondered how it, how it happened to come there. She bent a little toward him, drawing her cloak more closely about her. If it was acting, it was well done. It, it couldn't have been. It, it couldn't have been. He chucked the butt of his cigarette into the lake. Yes, I guess it was. It had an inscription on it: "Life and Death" by Hubert Ray. Oh my God! Where did you say you saw it, Bob? "'In your bedroom, against the wall, I thought it might be a portrait you'd had done, and so lifted. "'And I told them to put it out of sight. "'You see, Hubert didn't send it till after we'd left the house, just before he went to California. "'I'd given orders that it was to be locked up in an empty closet in my wardrobe room. "'Oh, Bob, darling, I don't know what you're going to think of me.' "'Oh, you're all right, mother. It wasn't you. I, "'I only wondered how you'd come by the thing at all.' She made an obvious effort at controlling emotion. "'Why, Bob, it was this way. After after what Jenny told me that day, I, I naturally thought a good deal about Hubert and, and their relations to each other.' "'She talked about them, did she?' "'Well, you see, in a way she had to. She was let in for it, poor thing. I can't tell you everything without giving you the whole story, and it's her story, as I've said before. I've no right to betray her, and least of all to you.' "'All right. Go on.' "'So when I'd heard that Hubert had a new picture at the Carla Gallery, and everyone was talking about it, and I knew from the things they said what what sort of a picture it was. "'Yes, yes, I understand. Well, then I, I went and saw it, and to get it out of sight I bought it on the spot. I didn't want it to be still on exhibition when you came back, and I hoped that people would forget it. I should have burned it at once, only that Hubert delayed sending it, and "'Well, you see how it happened. "'But even so, Bob, dear, you knew you were marrying a model. "'Oh, yes, it isn't that. Not altogether.' "'She laid her hand on his shoulder. "'What is it, Bob, darling? Can't you tell me? I'm your mother, dear.' "'But he moved away from her touch, as if unable to bear sympathy. "'I can't tell you yet, old lady. I must see my own way first. I've got to get through this business about the boy before I take any step whatever. She knows pretty well that I know that that she and Hubert are in love with, with each other. Oh, but Hubert is not in love with her. He told me so. Not in love with her? He cried sharply. Why isn't he? He said, oh, Bob, I can't talk about it. You'll... You've got to talk about it, mother. I can't half know. I must know. If he wasn't in love with her, what did he mean by making her think... I don't believe he did make her think. He hinted that, that there'd been something between them, but that, that with girls of that sort you, you couldn't call it love. Why couldn't you? Because— No, I won't, Bob. I'm your mother. I must make things easier for you, and not harder, and so— It will make things easiest for me to know the truth. So go on, out with it. Tell me just what he said. She wrung her hands beneath the cloak. He said, it, it couldn't be love with a girl whom— whom anyone could he sprang from the rail holding up his hand wait a minute mother jenny's my wife i'm her husband i believe in her with her speed in trimming her sails to the wind junior caught the direction i don't want you not to believe in her bob i didn't want to say any of the things that that you've been dragging out of me you know that 
Yes, I know that, old lady, and I'm grateful. I had to drag them out of you and know the worst that could be said so as to contradict it in, in my heart. Oh, in your heart? Yes, in my heart. It's where I'm strongest, just as it's where Dad is strongest, too, if he'd only be true to himself. But that's a side issue. What I want to say now, what I'd like you to understand, is that I know that Jenny is good and pure and true, and one of the sweetest and loveliest spirits God ever made. I know it. Junior couldn't be as feminine as she was, without gazing in awe and admiration of the tall, upright figure, which seemed taller and more upright for the moonlight. "'Would you know it—mind you, I'm only putting it this way—would you know it, with her own evidence to the contrary?' "'Yes, mother, I should know it, with her own evidence to the contrary.' She shivered and turned away from him. "'I must really go in now, dear. I'm so afraid of catching cold, but—' But good night. Having kissed him, she went down the steps, turning once more to look back at him. Silhouetted against the oblong of light between two rough pilasters, he was mechanically taking out his case and selecting a cigarette. You're splendid, Bob, she said, with a ring of sincerity that startled him. That's the way to love a woman. If there are only more men like you, and, I will say it, in spite of the things you've just made me confess, there must be something very, very good in a girl to, to call forth that kind of love. But Jenny herself made that kind of love more difficult. On returning to town, Bob found her changed. During all the weeks of the modus vivendi, she had been gentle, submissive, grateful, accepting his terms in the provisional spirit in which she understood them, and carrying them out. When Teddy's affairs were settled, and they never defined what they meant by that, she knew they were to have a reckoning, but the reckoning was to be postponed till then. And now, all at once, she seemed disposed to force it on. His visit to his family had frightened her. It frightened her the more in that he said so little about it. He, too, was changed. He was silent, pensive. He watched her more and talked to her less. But when he watched her, his eyes, so she said to herself, had a queer kind of sorrow in them. She didn't wonder at that. Anyone's eyes would have had sorrow in them, anyone who was seeing Teddy nearly every day and filling him up with fortitude. If it had not been for Teddy's sake, she would have done her best to get Bob out of it long ago. Her fear now was of not being able to make this attempt of her own accord. In other words, she shrank from being found out before confessing of her own free will. Twenty words from Mrs. Collingham to her son would rob her, Jenny, of such poor shreds of good intention as she still possessed. The trouble was, first, the lack of opportunity, and then, the waiting for the right emotional moment. It was not a thing you could spring at any chance hour of the day. Something must lead up to it and make it natural. But a week after his return from Sugar Maple Point, the occasion seemed to present itself. It was one of those evenings in late September when indoors was too stifling. In pursuance of his plans for distracting the family, which meant so much to Teddy, Bob had motored the mother and daughters to a small country restaurant where they had had supper, and had brought them home again. Lizzie and the two girls having said good night, Jenny was about to do the same, but he held her by the hand. "'Don't go in. Let's walk a bit.' "'So it's come,' Jenny thought. "'I must do it before we get home.' Even so she put it off. He, too, put off whatever in himself was burning to find words. They said as little as they could, without being altogether silent, and that little was mere commonplace. "'Wonderful night, isn't it?' "'Yes, and I think we're going to have a breeze. It isn't so hot as an hour ago.' "'Anyhow, the hot weather must be nearly over. It will be October in a day or two. "'But we often have very hot days in October. I remember that last year—' So they came to Palisade Walk, and turned into it. Though the moon was not yet up, the effulgence of its approach made a halo above the city. Manhattan was a line of constellations, the riverway a gulf of darkness in which were scattered stars. Along the parapet, shadowy couples, mostly lovers, formed little ghostly groups, while here and there was the point of light of a cigarette or cigar. They came to a halt, 
Jenny leaning against one of the dragon's teeth, looking over at the city, Bob standing a little back from her. "'I've never been here at night before,' he said. "'I'd no idea it was so beautiful.' "'We don't come here very often ourselves. We live so near that I suppose we're used to it.' "'We had some wonderful evenings at Sugar Maple Point, but that was another kind of thing.' She assembled her forces without turning to look at him, or making any change in her tone. "'I suppose you talked to your mother while you were up there?' <laughs> "'Of course.' "'About me?' Divining what was coming, he was on his guard. "'You were mentioned, naturally.' "'And she told you things?' "'Some things.' "'Some things about me that, that were new to you?' "'Yes, some things about you that were new to me.' "'Did she tell you everything?' "'I'm not in a position to say that it was everything, but—but but I rather think it was. What of it?' "'Oh, only that—that that I'm as bad as she said I was. I—I I wanted you to know that it was true.' The long stillness was broken only by a moan like that of a wounded monster from a ferry-boat far away. "'Why do you want me to know that?' he asked at length. "'So that you'll see now that when—when when everything is over about Teddy you'll be—' "'You'll be free.' "'But suppose I don't want to be free?' "'But I want it for you.' "'Why?' "'Oh, it's very simple.' She turned, leaning with her back to the rock. "'It's, it's just this, Bob. I'm not fit to be your wife. I never was fit. I never shall be fit. There it is, in a nutshell. It isn't education and social things that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm too... I, "'I don't know how to put it, but you're so big.' "'We'll drop all that, Jenny, if you don't mind, "'because it isn't a case of fitness on either your part or mine. "'It's one of love.' "'She hung her head. "'Oh, love, I, I, I don't think I, I know what it is.' "'I'm sure you don't. It's what I've told you. "'I wanted to show you what it's like. It, "'Do you know what I said to the old lady when she got off those things? "'She didn't want to do it, mind you,' he hastened to explain. She wanted to keep your secrets and be true to you, but I dragged them out of her. And do you know what I said to her? Well, I'm going to repeat it to you now. I said I wouldn't believe anything against you, not even on your own evidence. Is that love, Bob, or is it just being stubborn? I shall let you find that out for yourself, as we go on. Oh, as, as we go on? Yes, as we go on, Jenny. We're going on. "'Don't make any mistake about that. "'I know how you feel. "'Everything looks so dark to you now "'that you can't believe it will ever be light again. "'But it will be, Jenny. "'All families and all individuals go through these experiences, "'not so terrible as yours, perhaps, but terrible all the same. "'Not one of us is spared. "'Sometimes it seems to you as if you just couldn't go through with it. "'But you can. "'You must hang on and bear it, and it will pass.' That's what I'm here for, to help you to hang on, and, Jenny, clinging together as we're doing, we'll come out to the light, even Teddy and your mother. Oh, look, there the light is now, the light everlasting that always comes back if we only wait for it. At the pointing of his finger and his sudden cry, she turned to face the eternal wonder of the moonrise. End of chapter 25《ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバ Habit came to his aid by fitting them all to the situation as though they had never been in any other. They grew used to the fact that Teddy was in jail and might come out of it only by one exit. Teddy grew used to it himself. The family, once more at Murillo, grew used to the odd arrangement by which Bob and Jenny worked together and lived apart. The Colliums grew used to the thoughts of the Follets, and the Follets to that of the Colliums. You get used to anything. 
Junior commented to her husband, as one who has made a new discovery. It seems to me as if Edith's living in that flat on Cathedral Heights and keeping only one maid is all I've ever dreamed for her. To Bob, this wanting of the mind was the easier, because Ray stayed in California, his absence making it possible to leave in abeyance the subjects that couldn't yet be touched upon. The first chance of fortifying the three girls seemed to present itself on a night in that autumn when it was still warm enough to sit on the screened piazza. His car was, as usual, before the door, and in an hour or so he would be making his way to Murillo. As he had returned to his work at the bank, his spare time was now in the evenings. "'If you want to do something for me, Gladys, there's a way.' He said this in reply to an aspiration of all three, in which the youngest sister had been spokesman. Gladys's voice was eager and affectionate. "'What way, Bob? Tell us. We'll do anything.' Smoothing Pansy's back as she lay on his crossed knees, he considered how best to make it clear. Gladys sat close to him, as the one who most easily took him fraternally. Gussie, in whom he stirred an unusual self-consciousness, kept herself more aloof. Altogether in the shadow, Jenny was seemingly withdrawn, and yet more intensely aware of him than anyone. "'It's this way,' he tried to explain. "'Living is like climbing a mountainside.' You drag yourself up to a ledge where you can stand and take breath and feel that you've reached somewhere. Then, just as you think that you can camp there and be comfortable for the rest of your life, you find yourself summoned to move to the next ledge, higher up. At that, some of us get discouraged. Some fall, go off and go down. But most of us brace ourselves for another great big test. Do you see? Gladys answered doubtfully. I see a little— "'Well, then, the thing we need for the test is pluck, isn't it?' Gussie spoke dreamily. "'We need pluck for everything.' "'So we do, and I often think that we don't make enough of it. "'Pluck is different from courage, because it's, how shall I say, "'it's a little more cheery and intimate. "'Courage is like a Sunday suit that you wear for big occasions, "'but pluck is your everyday clothes which you need all the time and feel easy in. "'Courage is noble and heroic.' something they would be shy about claiming. Pluck is the courage of the common man, which anyone can feel he has a right to. "'I can't,' Gussie confessed. "'I'm the awfulest coward.' With this, Gladys agreed. "'Yes, Gus is a regular scare-cut. I'm not afraid of hardly anything.' "'We're all cowards in our way. But we could all be plucky when we might like to call ourselves brave. Do you get what I mean?' Gladys made a sound of assent which seemed to answer for all three. Well, what I'm trying to say is this, that the time has come when we're all being summoned, you three, and me, and Teddy, and all of us, to pull up to another ledge. It's going to be tough, but we can make up our minds that we can go through with it. I don't mean just knowing that we must go through with it, but knowing that we can. There was silence for the two or three minutes during which the girls thought this over. You said... Gladys reasoned, that it was something we could do for you. I don't see. You do it for me, because it's easier to pull with strong people rather than with weak ones. You see, this is something which no one of us can meet alone. We must all meet it together. And the stronger each of us is, the stronger we all are. Being strong is a matter of knowing that you're strong, just as being weak is the same. If I was sure that none of you was going to break down, I could be stronger myself, and we could all buck up Teddy. After another brief silence, Gladys sighed. All the same, it would be terrible if they did anything to him. Not more terrible than what millions of sisters faced in the last few years, with their brothers blown to bits. They were able to bear it by getting the idea that they could. Jenny spoke for the first time. Ah, but that was Gloria, and this is disgrace. Then it calls for more pluck, that's all. The test comes to one in one way and to another in another. Real glory is in meeting it. It was still Jenny who urged the difficulties. But when it's the hardest test that ever comes to anyone in the world... Why, then, it's pluck again, and still more pluck. It is the hardest test that ever comes to anyone in the world. It's harder than when women hear their boys are missing and never know what becomes of them. And that's pretty hard. 
But, Jenny, hard things are the making of us, and if we come through the hardest test in the world and still keep our kindlier feelings and our common sense, why, why then we come out pretty strong, don't we? Jenny said no more. She liked to have him talk to them in this way. It took for granted that they were worth talking to, and to become worth talking to had been a secret aim since the day when she first learned the value of pictures and books. A good many times she had stolen in to confer with the genial custodian at the Metropolitan, a good many volumes she had hidden in her room to study after she went to bed. She had proved to herself that she had a mind, and now Bob was hinting at unknown resources of strength. It nerved her, it put new heart in her, Having always been taught to consider herself weak, the suggestion that she should come through her test victoriously, that she could help him and Gussie and Gladys and Teddy and her mother to do the same, thrilled her like a sudden revelation. To Bob himself the theme was not a new one, though it was the first time he had ever got any of it into words. He had been mulling over it and round it ever since the war first called him from a state of mental lethargy. Needing then a clue to life, he had cast about him without finding one. Neither Groton nor Harvard had ever given him anything he could seize. His parents hadn't given him anything, nor had their religion. Mentally, he had gone to France, much as a jellyfish put to sea, to be tossed about without volition of its own, and get its support from the food that drifts its way. Nothing much had drifted his way, till he found himself in the hospital. There, in the long, empty days and sleepless nights, the why of things played in and out of his brain like a devil's tattoo. He hated to think that all he had witnessed was futility and waste, and yet no explanation that anyone gave him made it seem otherwise. The question of suffering was the one that most perplexed him. What was the good of it? Why had it to be? Even the agony of his slashed head and crushed foot was almost beyond bearing. And what was that in comparison with all the pain, physical and emotional, at that minute in the world? What was the idea? How did it get you anywhere? In as far as he received an answer, it came one night when he waked from a light doze. He waked repeating certain words which he recognised as vaguely familiar. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He said them over two or three times before getting their significance. "'That's it,' he thought then. "'That's why we have to go through all this rumpus. Thou, therefore, endure hardness. Endure it. Accept it. Rub it in. That's it, by gum!' The expletive was the strongest in which his feeble state allowed him to indulge. But he continued, "'That's what's the matter with me. I'm not hard. I'm soft. I'm soft inside. In my mind, in my heart—' I'm like putty, like dough. It isn't that I'm tender, I'm just soft. If I've ever had to bear anything hard, I've kicked like the dickens, and that's why I'm such an ass now. Thou, therefore, endure hardness. I'll be hanged if I won't try. So the trying came to be a kind of a religion. Not a very vital religion, or one as to which he was very keen, and yet a religion. During the winter he was seeing Jenny, and the spring he married her, and the summer he spent in South America, he had fumbled with it without getting hold of it. Not till he began his strivings with Teddy and his efforts to divert the minds of Teddy's family did it grow sharply defined to his vision as a way of life. Perhaps it was Teddy who taught him. Perhaps they mutually taught each other. He couldn't tell. He only became aware that something was working in the boy, like the might of spirit in the inner man. Possibly Teddy was learning more quickly than himself, because his lessons were more intensive. He noticed this first on the day when he went, at the lawyer's suggestion, to back up the argument that to plead guilty was the only help. "'I've done all I can with him,' Stenhouse declared. "'Now it's up to you. He thinks you're God, and say you may have some influence.' "'But I never will,' Teddy answered coolly. "'I never had done society, as the chaplain calls it, "'any harm if society hasn't done me harm to begin with. "'I may be guilty in the second place, "'but society is guilty in the first, "'and no one will make me say anything different from that.' 
That's all very well, Teddy, but society won't accept the plea. Then it can do the other thing. Bob's tone became significant. And you realise what, what the other thing might be? You bet I do. You can't live in Murderer's Row without having that rubbed into you. They talked softly in a corner of the visitors' room, because other little groups were scattered about, each centering round some sullen, swarthy man, wreathed in mystery and darkness. "'That's all right, old chap,' Bob agreed. "'But you see, don't you, that it's only a stand for an idea. "'It's a stand for telling the truth, isn't it? "'The truth, as you see it? "'The truth as it is, as I'm willing to bank on it.' "'Banking on it in a way that, that may call for a great deal of pluck. "'Well, I've got a great deal of pluck. "'Yes, if you've got enough. "'It's one thing to say so now, "'and another to prove it when the time comes.' In his suppressed vehemence, Teddy grasped Bob's wrist, as the hands of both lay on the small table above which their heads came together. "'I've got the pluck for anything but to go before their court and say what you want me to say. I took the money because my father and mother, after slaving for society all their lives, had a right to it. I shot a man because they got me so jumpy with all the wrongs they'd done me that I didn't know what my hand was up to. If they won't let me have my kind of justice—' They don't have to dope me out of their own, and I'll swallow it. Another conversation, in the same spot, and with heads together in the same way, was gentler. I know pretty well what they're going to hand me out, and it'll all be all right. What kind of life would I have now, even if they acquitted me? What could I have had her even if I'd never got into this scrape at all? I'm not cut out for big things. I'm just the same size as poor old Dad— and I'd have gone the same way. Mars got it straight. It's not good enough. Think of rotting in an office all your life just to reach the gorgeous sum of forty-five a week, and when you've got it to be chucked into the hell of the unemployed. Say, Bob, why can't everyone have enough in a world where there's plenty to go round? I guess it's because we haven't the right kind of world. But why haven't we? We've been at it long enough. Perhaps not. That may be where the trouble lies. When life came on this planet, to begin with, it took millions of years to get it anywhere. Nobody knows how long it was before the thing that lived in the water could creep on the land. But it was time to be reckoned by ages. When you come to ages, the, the human race is young. It's made a life for itself which it doesn't know how to swing. In a few more ages it may learn, but it hasn't yet learned as yet. Teddy reflected. "'So you've just got to take it as it is. "'That seems to be the number. "'We may kick because it isn't perfect, "'but we don't know how to make it perfect. And "'That's all there is to say. "'It's easier for your kind to say than for ours. "'It's not as easy as it seems for any kind. "'I don't see anyone, rich or poor, "'who hasn't to spend most of his energy in bucking up. "'The poor think it's easier for the rich because they have the money.' and the rich think it's easier for the poor, because they haven't the responsibilities. So there you are. I begin to think that making yourself strong, hard, tough in your inner fibre, is about the biggest asset you can bring to life. Or death, Teddy said softly. Or death, Bob agreed. On another occasion, Teddy was in another mood. "'If I didn't get it now, I guess it would have come along later, "'so that it's just as well to have it over.' "'Bob's mind went back to Stenhouse's view of Teddy's character. "'What do you mean by that?' "'Oh, just what I say. "'You can't see red like me without being a more dangerous cuss than you mean to be. "'I'd have got into trouble some time, even if I hadn't done this.' "'Before Bob could find a response, Teddy went on. "'I suppose you think that because I don't say anything about Flynn, "'I haven't got him on my mind.' "'Well, you're wrong.' Oh, "'I didn't think that. "'But what can I say? "'I think and think and think and then begin thinking again. "'So that,' he jerked out, "'that's a reason, too.' "'A reason for what, Teddy?' "'He answered obliquely. "'I can't keep up that kind of thinking. "'I'll go crazy if I do. "'I'd rather be sent to where I can get another point of view. "'I don't care what kind of point of view it is, "'so long as it isn't this one.' "'If I come face to face with Flynn, I believe I could make him understand. "'Do you suppose there's any chance of that?' 
it was inevitable that in the long run speculative questions should lead them further still. "'What do you suppose God is?' Teddy said unexpectedly one day. Bob smiled. "'Ask me something easier. But you must have some idea.' I'm "'Not sure that I have. Don't you believe in God? I should have thought that you'd be the kind of cuss who would.' I don't know that you can call it believing. It's more like like having a kind of instinct, helped out by a little thinking. Have I got the instinct? Can't you tell that yourself? If I told you, you'd howl. No, I shouldn't. Go to it. Teddy laughed sheepishly, as if he had ventured to peer into secrets which were none of his business. I'll tell you the way God seems to me. It's all come to me while I've been in there. He nodded towards the cells. I don't seem to see him as a great big man, the way the chaplain says he is. He's all right, the chaplain, and he doesn't seem to know anything about God. He can gas away to beat the band about law and society and the good of the community and hell to pay when you don't respect them. But when it comes to God, it's Nick's. Well, what do you make out for yourself? I haven't made it out exactly. It's as if some great big hand had pulled aside a curtain. "'but it's a curtain that I didn't know was there. "'See?' "'Yes, I see. And what does it show you? That, "'That's the funny part of it. "'I can't tell you what it shows me. "'I don't exactly see it. I only know. "'Mind you, I'm just telling you how it seems to me. "'I only know that it's God.' "'But I suppose if you know that it's God, do "'you have an idea of what it's like?' Y "'Yes, it, it's like... "'like a country into which I am travelling. "'Not with my body, see, but with myself. "'No,' he corrected, "'that's not it. "'It isn't a country. "'It's more like a life. "'Oh, shucks, I haven't got it straight yet. "'Now, look, this is the way it is. "'Suppose that everything we see was alive, "'that these chairs were alive, "'and the walls and the table, "'that every blamed thing we ever touched or used was alive, "'and had a voice. "'See?' "'Bob nodded that he saw.' Now, suppose every voice was trying to make you understand things. The table would say, This is the way God wants you to work. And the chair, This is the way God wants you to rest. And the walls, This is the way God stands round you and backs you up. Everything would be helping you then, instead of putting itself dead against you the way we have it here. I get the idea, but would that be God? Over this question, the boy's face brooded thoughtfully. It mightn't be God in the way that you or you and I am me. It would be more like a way of knowing God. It's like my case in the courts. It's set down as the people against Edward S. Follett. But I don't see the people. I only feel what they do to me. It's something like that. I don't see God, but I kind of feel. He broke with another apologetic laugh. Oh, I guess it's all wrong. Gussie would call me a gump. It just kind of gets you, that's all. It makes me feel as if I was moving on into something, but I guess I'm not. The pensive silence that followed was broken by Bob saying, That's what I mean by instinct. Teddy resumed as if he hadn't heard. When I wake up in the night, I'm waking up in the night in that place with snores and groans and guys talking in their sleep and having nightmares. Some stunt, believe me. But when I do... It's just as if I had great big arms round me, and someone was saying, All right, Teddy, I'm holding you. Keep a stiff upper lip. I'll make it as easy as I can for you and end everyone else. I'm just drawing you, drawing you, drawing you, a wee little bit at a time. Over here, where you'll get your big chance. What's more, Bob? He went on, as if touched on the heart of his interest. It says it'll take care of Finn and his wife and his poor little kiddies and do the things. Once more he broke off with his uneasy laugh. Ha! <laughs> What's the use? You think I'm a quitter, don't you? Why should I think that? Oh, I don't know. I talk like a quitter, but it isn't that. If I could still do anything for Ma and the girls. I'm looking after them, old boy. So there you are. What'll be the good of my staying? He added between clenched teeth. God, I'd hate to go back. Back into the world? He spoke as if to himself. You see, that day, the day the thing happened, and they 
came and caught me and did all those things to me, and I saw Flynn lying by the road. It was, it was a kind of sickener. If putting me out of the way is the thing in the wind, it was done right there and then. Right there and then I seem to have begun, moving on. He drew a long breath. And I'd rather keep moving, Bob, no matter to where, no matter to what, than turn back again to face a bunch of men. End of chapter 26